Welcome back, New Hope Bible College video series. Uh, this lesson today will be our study of the poetic books. In particular, we're looking at the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, the, the lessons from Solomon's life of what he thought, how he figured he can get things worked out on his own, things he sought after. Uh, I believe that Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon when his heart was right with God. Uh, because before he got right with God, he started looking around for other things, thinking that things around would make him happy. He sought for wealth, we know that. Wives, we know that. Uh, he wanted to be superior in, in all ways. Uh, Ecclesiastes tells us that he would get singers together, uh, thinking that would soothe his problems, and it didn't work. He'd build buildings, uh, make a name for himself, and he did that, but that didn't give him the peace in his heart that he needed. So whether it's through wealth or women, through alcohol, uh, whatever it might be, whatever pleasures this world has to offer are not going to bring the peace of God. You know, later on in Ecclesiastes, the last chapter, he says, let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. is to fear God and keep his commandments. But this is the whole duty of man. He finally got it there in chapter 12, but... Uh, he wasted so much of his life. Uh, that's why the kingdom was tore apart. You remember uh, that uh, God took the kingdom and rent it to the northern and southern kingdom because Solomon tried to do things his own way. We have to be very, very careful about that, uh, doing what God would have us to do. Uh, this is the search for peace and purpose of life, and the irony is that peace is right with us. As believers, we have uh, Jesus Christ who gives us a peace that passes all understanding if we so choose. Uh, we have to want, we have to uh, ask God. We have to make sure our hearts are where they ought to be. Uh, and, and God does give us peace in troublous times. And you know, I'm, I'm always reminded of the story of David, how that David, as king of Israel, uh, had everything that he thought that he wanted and decided to stay home when the battle was taking place. And staying home, he looked over and saw a young woman, we know who she was, Bathsheba. Uh, her grandfather was a man by the name of Ahithophel. Ahithophel was one of David's uh, uh, advisors, one of his counselors. Uh, ended up going away from David later on, probably because of the story of Bathsheba, uh, betraying him, going with Absalom. Uh, David's son against David, uh, and when Absalom wouldn't take Ahithophel's advice, Ahithophel ends up committing suicide and hangs himself. A uh, very tragic story there, but it shows us how far sin goes. It's not just, you know, it affects one person. David's sin just did not affect him. It affected Joab. It affected Bathsheba. It affected David's children. It affected the nation of Israel. Uh, it just one mess after another. Uh, why? Because David wasn't content with what he had. You know, Paul said in Philippians 4, I've learned in what sort of state I am there with to be content. He talks about, I know how to be abased. I know how to be down. And I know how to abound. I know how, you know, when times are good, I know how to handle those as well. But he said, you know, I've learned in what sort of state I am there with to be content. David did not have contentment. Solomon did not have contentment. And he seeks after that thinking that Bathsheba will give him contentment, or for Solomon, wealth will give him great contentment. And that doesn't work, of course. What, what works? Well, after David's sin is revealed to all of Israel and all of the world, David realizes that what he did was wrong, and he tells Nathan you know, that he repented of that. But in Psalm 51, he says, he asked God, he said, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Now, we know, uh, class, you know, uh, he didn't ask to restore salvation. And all that David did and all the wickedness that he did, he didn't lose the salvation. That's not what he asked for. He said, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. David has lost his joy. We know the book of 1 John is a whole book written about joy and the importance of joy and fellowship with God. 1 John 1, 4, these things write with you that your joy may be full. 
And it talks about we have fellowship with God, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ's Son cleanses us from all sin. The importance of having fellowship. David did not have the peace of God there because he didn't have the joy, he didn't have the fellowship with God, and he allowed that to affect him and many, many other lives. Solomon, same thing, exact same thing. Here, what's he do? Well, he tries it on his own, thinking that what I do will bring me happiness, what I do will bring contentment. It doesn't work that way. Uh, our, in order to have contentment, we need to trust God. If you won the lottery, that wouldn't give you contentment. I know people that, oh, well, make, you know, make me happy. Well, maybe, but it's God that brings peace. It's God that brings contentment. And that's what we, we need, that's what we need to trust God. Well, here in Ecclesiastes 7, it tells us some things here that it's better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. You know? But we have this information here, but how often do people go to places where they don't want to hear what they want to hear? You know, uh, Michael Jackson would probably be alive today if he did not have a yes man for a doctor. The, he wanted the propanol. He wanted that, that calming peace that that gate would give him in his sleep. And so he paid a doctor to come to his house and give it to him. And of course the doctor messed up everything. You know, we all know what happened with that. doctor goes to prison. Uh, Michael Jackson loses his life because he thinks that's going to bring contentment. But the fact is, the world may give us anything that we want, but we're not going to have the peace of God. At a funeral, we hear the rebuke of the wise and the party and the song of fools. Uh, can a funeral be good? Absolutely. In fact, the book of uh, Ecclesiastes says that the funeral, the death day, is better than the birthday. Now, why is that? Well, you know, remember uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Hanani, Michelle, and Azariah. The worst thing that could have happened to them, there's the fire, fire furnace. The very worst thing that could have happened is exactly what happened. They lived. The best thing that could have happened to them is they would have died and been with the Lord in a place where there's no heartache, no troubles, no trials, whatever. Uh, no, uh, they, the best thing did happen to them. For a believer, to be with the Lord is far better than anything else. Now, I know that God's put within all of our hearts a desire to live because if we didn't have that desire to live, we would all go to be with Him as soon as we could. But Paul even struggled with that. You know, he said, I, you know, for me to depart would be better, but, you know, it's expedient or it's, it's necessary for me to stay here because, why? I have a job to do. I have a ministry to perform. Well, <clears throat> funerals can be better if a child of God is going home. Uh, it, funerals can be horrible if an unsafe person dies and goes to hell. So it all depends upon the relationship with God. The laughter of fools is like the crackling of thorns in a fire. If you've got a fireplace and you've got the thorns you throw in there for heat, they're going to crackle real quick, burn up, be consumed, gone, not going to provide very much heat uh, there. Ecclesiastes 7, 8 says, Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Why is that? Well, the fact is, you know, a lot of times we make plans of what we're going to do when we decide this. I remember there's a church not too far from here on 158 several years ago. They built the foundation for the new church, new sanctuary, I guess. And had it built there and everything, the foundation was down, but apparently they ran out of money. And it was years and years before they went back and finally did finish the building. But what did they have to do? Tear down that first down foundation and start all over again. Why? Because they did not prepare for the future. And they did not do, obviously didn't do what God wanted them to do. The Bible tells us that we need to count the cost, make sure that we can do uh, whatever it is that God would call us to do. The day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth for the believer. Absolutely true. Uh, but it has application more than just one's overall life. Uh, you know, many projects start with good intentions, but they're not completed. When they're finished, you know, we can truly look back with satisfaction. Many things begin with grief and difficulty, only to end in joy and peace. I mean, how many stories have you heard of people talking about their marriages when they first got married? And they didn't have uh, two sticks to rub to, uh, together. They uh, would have to go in together and, and buy a hamburger and, and half the hamburger uh, so that they would have food that evening. 
And when they talk about it, they look back with fondness of how nice it was for them to have that relationship and where they can you have the simplest things in life brought great pleasure. Uh, I, most people look back fondly on those things, not in a negative way here. Uh, it might have been tough at the time, but you look back and see how God worked out in your life, all the situations, uh, and it, it is, it's good to look at the overall plan of God. Luke says, talking about building, prepared for a building here, he says, For which of you, intending to build a tower, sits not down first and counts the cost, where the gift is sufficient to finish it? Thus happily, after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him. The importance of following through. The importance of doing exactly what you said you were going to do. I, I know a lot of people have big plans of what they want to do, and they talk about them and tell everybody what they're going to do, and then things change quickly, and they don't do what they said they were going to do. People don't, they kind of lose respect for them after that. You know, we have to be prepared to count the cost. Uh, <clears throat> Psalm 126, 5 6, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goes forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. So, here we have the uh, patience or pride in opposing words here. Uh, pride is evil. It's of the world. But the Bible talks about 1 John 2.16. We're not to love the world, neither things in the world. The lust of flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the, the pride of life. We go to Isaiah 14. Uh, five times in Isaiah 14, the phrase, I will, is used. And we call those... Uh, the five I wills of Satan that he said I will be like the most high I'll make my place in the heavens he wanted to take over the place of God and it was pride that brought him down and pride usually is at the, the, the basis for all sin when it comes down to it uh, of things that we want, things we want better we want more, we want ever stealing uh, it's sad how pride can destroy patience though is a virtue to be pursued by the, the person of God now Patience doesn't mean contentment necessarily. Uh, Job, book of uh, James says Job was a man of patience, a man of endurance. Job made it through. And patience sometimes is endurance. You know, Isaiah 40, 31, verse I use for my life verse, and very precious verse to me. But it says, they that wait upon the Lord. And that word wait, if you look up that word wait, and you don't have to know Hebrew or Greek in order to understand the Bible. The Holy Spirit gives us understanding when we need it. But that word wait is an interesting word if you look it up. Because the word wait there means to bind together. You know, to bind together brings strength. If I were to bind my hand together, it would be hard for somebody to pull them apart. Much harder for them to pull that apart than if I just put my hand side by side. Put them side by side, boom. Bound together. And so that patience, we wait upon the Lord. We, we have that patience with God, we're waiting on Him. We're bound together with Him. Not just sitting around doing nothing, waiting for God to return, but rather we're waiting with Him, bound together with Him, serving Him the whole time. So patience, that, that endurance, waiting with God, bound together with Him. How important that is for us to do that, to make sure that we are doing what God wants. See, pride leads to contention. Pride leads to destruction. Uh, that's again, you know, nations fight nations out, out of pride. Uh, they uh, have this contention. Pride leads to anger. You know, I'm better than you are, so therefore you'll be mad at me because I say that. That brings anger back and forth. It serves no use for us. However, patience, though, leads to understanding. You know, sometimes God answers our prayer immediately by saying yes or no. Sometimes he answers our prayer by saying, wait. How long? I don't know. You know the, the word importunity is found in, uh, I believe, Luke chapter 18. And it's talking about the man who knocks on his neighbor's door. And it says, because of his importunity, the man rose up and, and answered. That word importunity is, means persistence. We have persistence in our prayers. We're waiting for God, but we are persistently praying. And it may take some prayers years before they're answered. But we, we endure that. We have patience with God that we, are, we trust in Him 
and again, doesn't mean your life always going to be happy. Job, who was that man of endurance, was he content with the uh, situation he was in? No. He was upset. He was mad at himself. He was mad at others. He, his friends were of no comfort to him, no lies to him. Uh, no, Job was in a tough situation, but Job made it through to chapter 42. Why? Because he endured that. He went through all the struggles and trials that uh, were before him, and he made it through and did exactly what God would have him do. Patience also leads to salvation. Now, I know we're conditioned in Christianity to think of that word salvation merely for accepting Jesus Christ our Savior, and now we have salvation or we're saved. And it does work that way, yes. That word salvation is a great word, uh, talking about our eternal future with, with the Lord. But salvation simply means deliverance. It could be deliverance from our sin, and praise God, that's our spiritual salvation. But it could be deliverance from whatever problem that we're facing at the time. Uh, the, an answer to prayer. And so if we're patient with God, and we don't give up, we don't turn our back on God, we, we pray and pray and pray, we have that endurance, and God delivers. And we see Romans 2, uh, 7, Hebrews 10, 36, some great references here for these uh, passages here. Well, Ecclesiastes then goes on, says here in chapter 7, Say not thou, what is the cause that the former days were better than these? For thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. So-called good old days. You know, it's amazing that how we are as human beings sometimes. That we'll look back at our life and talk about how much worse we had it than they do today. You know, I used to tell the story that uh, as a kid, uh, we lived on one side of town, on the uh, north side of town, and the schools were on the south side of town. And so we had to get up, we had to walk to school, we had to walk through the downtown, uh, back lake where I'm from, and uh, walk there, Appalachian Power Company, and we walked to the school there. And I thought, you know, it's got to be at least a couple miles, I thought. And for a long time, that's, you know, pretty much what I concluded, you know, a mile and a half, two miles, whatever it was. Uh, wasn't a, whole, a large distance, but, you know, sufficient. Well, I decided one day when I went back that, I would drive it off to see how far that it was. Well, it turned out it was just about a quarter of a mile. And to be honest with you, it really wasn't that far because that's driving. If you cut through yards like we did, it, it was even shorter than that. But in my mind, I had it one way, but in reality, it was a different way. So sometimes we don't remember things the same way. But we tell you know, our kids, well, we had it far worse than what you did. Or we tell them, oh, we had it much better. When I was a kid, man, three loaves of bread for a dollar. Forget to tell you that the wages were about a tenth of what they are today. So, no, it's not that things are necessarily better in the so-called good old days here. Memory has a way of forgetting bad things in the past, and, and that's good that we have that. Uh, even one experiences trials in the present, there's still cause for rejoicing. To know that God's in control. The troubles we have, yes, they're tough. Some of you are going through very tough times. The world is going through a tough time right now with this coronavirus. But before this, how many people do you know had a conversation about the Spanish flu, the flu pandemic of 1918? Uh, how many of you talked about people that had died during that time? And a huge amount of people, I think it was somewhere 3 to 5% of the world's population, I think they were uh, believed died from that pandemic. Uh, but in our lifetime, we didn't talk about it. We knew about it, maybe, if we read it in, in a history book. There's no thought there. Why? Because things like that, you know, we, we kind of push out of our mind. Same thing's going to be true with what's going on today. Yes, it's a tough time for living in today. And praise God, He's still in control. Uh, but, you know, however soon it be, uh, it is, I hope it's very, very soon. All this is over with. We can go back about regular lives throughout the world. People can get back to their jobs. I hope it's very soon, but if it's not, God's still in control. And whenever it is, there'll be a time when people won't forget all this and think that uh, everything is, is fine. Well, it will be fine. Don't neglect opportunities for good in the present because you're dwelling in the past. And a lot of times I've heard people say, well, you know, I can't serve God. I can't do this in church because you just don't know my past. You don't know what I did. Well, I know a God who knows what you did. And I know a God who forgives completely. You, you, there may be things that you did that uh, 
had, there's consequence in your life now because of that. I get that. But God doesn't put anybody on the shelf. God doesn't stop using people because of sin. If he did, God would have quit using David, but he didn't. Uh, David went on to, to do some great and mighty things for God. So don't neglect the opportunities to do the right thing. Just because you had a failure in your past, God forgives. The advantages of wealth, and notice I have a question mark there. Uh, I miss a misspelled word there, Proverbs, so two, two E's there. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, the Bible tells us money, for wisdom is a defense, and money is a defense. But the excellent thing of knowledge is that wisdom gives life to them that have it. Uh, money can, can help in life. There's no doubt about that. I mean, money is not evil. Remember, the Bible says it's the love of money that is the root of all evil. So money is not evil. It can be used for good. Uh, money can attract many friends. You know, the story uh, there is several years back in uh, uh, West Virginia when the man, I think his name was Whitaker, if I'm not mistaken, uh, won a huge lottery, 300 some million, whatever it was, just a, a huge amount of money. Uh, he spoiled his granddaughter so much that he had to start hiring friends for her. He would pay them as much as $500 a week to hang around her uh, because nobody wanted to be around. She was so obnoxious because of, of the wealth. Uh, that money didn't do them any good at all. She ended up dying. Her mother died. Her boyfriend died. Uh, her, this man who won the money, his wife left him throughout all this, ended up filing bankruptcy. So, no, money can be helpful, but money can destroy. It's where we have to get back to trusting God and believing that God is what matters. It says, the excellency of knowledge is that wisdom gives life to them that have it. You know, back in James chapter 1, verse 5, it says, if we lack wisdom, uh, what do we do? Well, we ask God. And the Bible says what? That God will give it to, to all, liberally. It, uh, great if not, God will give us the wisdom if we, need, if we ask for it. You know, Solomon, when he became king, he was 20 years old, and he started off pretty good. Was, at least his attitude was really good. Uh, he went to Gibeon to offer up sacrifices to God, uh, to worship Him. That's where the ark was at that time. Uh, I get, you know, yeah, that's where the ark was at that time, housed at that time, before he later on, seven years later, had the temple built. But he, he knew that he was going to be king. And he tells God, he said, I'm but a child. I don't know how to go out and come in. How am I going to judge this thy people? I don't have the ability to do that, God. And so he asked God for an understanding heart there in 1 Kings 3 and 2 Chronicles 1. You can read the stories there. But he asked God for, for, for understanding heart. He asked God for wisdom. And God gave him wisdom. We know the story here of this great wisdom that Solomon possessed. But the problem was Solomon didn't utilize that wisdom. Not much in his life. Sometimes yes, but for the most part no. We have access to the exact same wisdom. Everybody talks about Solomon as the wisest man that ever lived. Well, it wasn't his wisdom that mattered. It's God's wisdom. And if we go to God, James 1, 5 again, a heart's right with God, we're where we ought to be. We go to God. God can give us that wisdom, will give us that wisdom on a daily basis. But it's not a one-time asking God. It's not just simply saying, God, give me wisdom for the rest of my life so that I make all the right decisions. It's every situation that we face. We ask God for wisdom, for understanding, in order to accomplish what God would have us to accomplish. That's why it's so important that we, we rely upon the wisdom of God, not upon our wealth. Yes, does money help? In many ways, yes, it does. Right? But it's not the solution. It's the wisdom of God. Wisdom is better. Riches don't profit, profit in the day of wrath. Uh, I don't remember the numbers. Uh, I believe Steve Jobs was 56 years old when he died, uh, worth several billion dollars, uh, maybe 13 billion, whatever it was, huge amount, uh, just, just an amount that really is even unnecessary, so, so much money that he had. Uh, but he died at the age of 56, and all the money that he had wasn't enough to, to save his life. Uh, if he would, could give it all away and live longer, he probably would have done that. Riches don't profit. 
in the day of wrath. They don't profit in, in, in death. It's not the, the answer. Wealth can make things worse. Again, this man in West Virginia, you won the lottery. You can look up, type in lottery curse on, uh, in your search engine there and see how many people end up bankrupt or dead because they trusted the money. They weren't trusting in God. They trusted the money. Wisdom will make the best use of wealth. Nothing wrong with having money. If a person does with it what God would have them to do, there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. To be a billionaire, that's great. If you can be a billionaire, be a billionaire. But make sure you're trusting God for the solution and not trusting your own abilities because, again, it can make things far worse. Wisdom will help one weather the storms. The tough times we're going through right now. Uh, and they are tough. And you know, uh, it's going to be very, very difficult for people as time goes on. Those not able to work because uh, of their profession is not able to work at this point. Uh, therefore, no income. Uh, that's tough. Even as believers, that's going to be a tough situation for them. That's why we all have to dig in and to encourage one another, pray for one another, help one another. You know, I talk about uh, prayer, uh, praying for things sometimes. We, we go to God and ask God to answer our prayer with His financial need or not. And I try to challenge myself with this as well, uh, and I've challenged other people with this, is instead of asking God to answer your prayer, ask God to make you an answer to someone else's prayer. Because when we pray and we ask God for finances, God uses people to do that. God doesn't, we don't pray and open up our eyes and boom, here's $100 laying on the table. God uses someone to put that money in our path. Instead of asking God for things, ask God to be the answer to someone's prayer. Look around you, the world we live in today. There are people suffering. There are people uh, with great financial need that will probably never speak of it out to you but they're going through a tough time. And you know who they are. And just be there willing to help, whether it's encouraging, whether it's giving money, whatever it might be. But trust God. Ask God for wisdom. We're going through a lot of storms today. Uh, wisdom gives life to those who have it. I mean, true life. The joy of life. The contentment that we need. How important wisdom is. We need to accept the things that cannot be changed. What's the old serenity prayer, I think it's called... Uh, God grant me the wisdom to accept the things I cannot change, uh, to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. I may not be quoting that exactly, but uh, you get the gist of what I'm trying to say here. Is that sometimes things can't be changed. You know, we, you can pray and pray and pray. Remember Moses. God told him to uh, lead the children of Israel through the wilderness and to strike the rock there in the wilderness one time at the beginning, and not to, after that just to speak to the rock. And Moses, in a fit of anger, one day struck the rock. And God told him, because you did this, you're not going into the promised land. So 40 years, Moses led the people. During the last year, Moses came to Mount Nebo. And Mount Nebo is today is in the country of Jordan. It overlooks the promised land. And you can, from there, you can see where Jericho was at, the Jordan River. And Moses is right there. And Deuteronomy 3, he asked God, he said, Lord, just let me go in and see the land. And God gave him a, a vision of the land at that point. God didn't allow him to go in. He gave him a vision of it. But God told him, no, I'm not going to let you go in and speak to no more of me to this matter. In other words, I said no, don't ask me again. That cannot be changed. God put that in place. There are things in our life that cannot be changed. And we need to ask God to help us to accept those things that cannot be changed. Uh, prayer does change things, but God doesn't give us everything that we want. He gives us what we need if we are in our right relationship with Him. Sometimes He gives us things that we want, but there's some things that's just not going to change. And that's just the way that it is. And so what we do is we accept that uh, uh, rather than uh, struggling with it the rest of our life, we just accept the fact that some things will not be changed. God has His purposes which we can't change. His purpose allows for both days of prosperity and the days of adversity. Again, going back to Paul in Philippians chapter 4, he talks about the struggles that he had in life and how that uh, he, he did go to hard times. And you know, talk about, he said, I know how to be full uh, and I know how to be hungry. 
And you know, I always tell people, you know, there's only one way to know how to be hungry, and that's through experience. You don't read a book on how to be hungry and understand what it means to be hungry. Paul at times went without nourishment, and he suffered during that time, but he knew, still knew God was in control, and God would eventually give him the sustenance that he needed in life, and God will do that uh, for us as well. But God does allow sometimes, that's because of hard times, to encourage us, not, not to destroy us, but to help us in life. So we should enjoy the days of prosperity and days of adversity, consider what lessons might be learned. You know, if you're going through a tough time, and we are today as a, as a world, going through a tough time, what can we learn from this? To point the finger at them other guys, it's all their fault? That's not going to help anything. But we can go to God and say, Lord, I'm going through a tough time right now. I need your help. I need wisdom to know exactly what to do. Uh, and, and God is there for us. We all know that. Uh, do things in proper moderation. You know? uh, extremes can create problems. We see one of life's vanities is that the righteous don't always prosper, nor the, do the wicked always suffer. Scriptures say the, the grace is not always to the swift. The best person doesn't always win. Sometimes the most wicked win. And we get so frustrated with that at times, thinking how in the world, you know, I, here I am, I, I go to church when I can, I, I serve God, I give financially, and my car broke down, and it just seems like life is just one pitfall after the other. And I look down the road, the neighbor's got a new Mercedes down there, they don't go to church, I just don't get it, God. We can get frustrated like that. But, you know, God didn't say that we'll have everything that we want. But we don't know what's going on in that person's mind that has the Mercedes. We don't know what kind of life that they have. We see what they want us to see, but we don't always see reality. Well, we can struggle with a car. And I remember when I first got married, we had a, I had a Volkswagen, uh, a Volkswagen Beetle. And we were struggling, like most people do. And, uh, the battery, we didn't have enough money to buy a new battery for the car, so I learned to park it on a hill everywhere I went. Where I worked at, I'd parked on a hill, did a straight drive, and just popped the clutch. Uh, started up at the house, I would park uh, on the side of the house, so it had a slight hill there. So I'd go down the hill in the morning, get it started, and went through life like that. And I missed that car. <laughs> uh, it, it was a, a, a fun time in our life. So, yeah. You know, just because it's not the best doesn't mean we can't enjoy what we've got. And if we enjoy it, then I guess really it is the best, isn't it? Uh, here, the, the preacher, Solomon, saw what uh, Job's friends didn't see. Uh, they reasoned, Job's friends, that uh, righteous never suffer. That only the wicked do. Well, that's obviously not true. Again, rain falls upon the just and the unjust. With Elisha and them, they went through a famine just like the king did. Uh, went through tough times. Uh, Job, like the uh, preacher, knew that wasn't always the case. Yes, the righteous do suffer. Yes, we do go through hard times. And I'm not saying we will enjoy them, but I am saying we'll get through them if we trust the Lord. Job, the preacher, knew the ultimate end of the wicked. Yeah, it does seem like they're prospering, but Psalm 37, fret not thyself because of evildoers. Why? Because... They'll be like a chaff, which wind drives away. God's eventually going to take care of them. Uh, having what they have, that is not going to make us happy. Uh, the wicked are reserved for the day of doom and wrath. Uh, it would be well, though, for those who, who fear God. If we do what God wants to do, we'll, we'll make it through this. One should avoid extremism in seeking to be righteous and wise. Now, I, I know that word sounds wrong, we should be righteous. And, you know, how can that be too extreme? Well, I'm talking about the righteousness is born of pride and arrogance. The self-righteousness that we have. Where we think that we're better because we have this. We're better because we have that ability. Uh, the Pharisees, classic example of being overly righteous. They're very prideful in that they kept the laws that they kept. Uh, didn't mention the ones they didn't keep. Uh, there's always a wisdom to be avoided. And that's the wisdom of this world. You know, sometimes people think that wisdom comes through age. Now, experience comes through age. And we might have made right decisions in life that help us down the road. But wisdom, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Uh, wisdom is, 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 comes from God. This wisdom 
is born out of pride and arrogance. The proper wisdom it comes directly from God, where we ask in Him in uh, whatever situation we're facing. One should always avoid extremism and wickedness and foolishness. Does that mean a little bit of wickedness is okay? No, I'm not saying that either. Uh, not again that a little wickedness and folly is ever acceptable to God. But you know, we need to make sure in our lives. You, know, uh, you can look up in the, your Bible uh, the word presumptuous or presumed. Uh, sometimes look up that word, and it talks several instances talks about sin in regards to those words. Uh, the children of Israel, when they were told they couldn't go into the promised land in the book of Numbers, the Bible says the people mourned greatly. Uh, when God struck down the ten spies and said, no, we cannot do it. And Joshua and Caleb alone says, yes, we can. And so God struck them down. The Bible says the people mourned greatly. And the next verse says, and they rose up early in the morning, and they went up to the mountain and said, lo, we be here, for we will go in for your sin. Well, God said, no, absolutely not. They didn't care about that. They weren't listening to God. They got up early and said, no, we're here. God has given us land. We're going to go in. Oh, 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 yeah, we've sinned. That covers it. Just saying, you know, oh, my bad. No, sorry. No, it didn't cover it all. And it goes on to say, because they have presumed to go in anyway, even though God said absolutely not, what happened? God says those that get, tried to go in will die. What happened? Those that tried to go in would die. And so... Uh, the other type of sin, there's two types of sin in the Bible, the presumed, the presumptuous. The word presumptuous today, we would use the word premeditated. The other is sins of ignorance. Uh, sins that we commit without any thought put to them. Uh, are there one consequence uh, as bad as the other? No, the consequence is different from, from different sin. I know people say, well, all sin is sin and all sin is bad. Yes, it is. But does all sin have the same consequence? No. No. You, you steal my pencil, that's a sin. It's not that big a problem. You shoot me, that's a bigger problem, a greater consequence for that. So, yeah, a, there are different degrees of punishment for sin, depending on the, what they are. But the presumptuous sin, premeditated sin, are sins that people choose to do, knowing full well this is not what God wants, and going ahead and doing it anyway, and just thinking, well, after I do it, I'll just ask God to forgive me and everything will be fine. No, not for premeditated sin. The, the consequence is far, far greater than just a sin of ignorance, or uh, what we might say a little sin, or so-called little white lie, whatever that means. No. Uh, God may be long-suffering and provide opportunity to repent for some, but others who not. Remember the first Corinthians uh, 11, the Lord's table, what took place there? The Bible says because they ate and drank unworthily, some were sick among them, and some died or some sleep. Uh, why did some die, and why did some get sick? And we also have the fact that some may not saw any consequences whatsoever. Why is that? Same church, same group of people. Why did some die? I think it goes with the attitude of sin that they committed. Where they're presumptuous, some may have uh, drank unworthily out of ignorance, and some thought, you know, God will forgive me later. You know, uh, the consequence can be far greater. While his anger and wrath might be moved to cut off those who arrogantly and openly despise him, like in Acts chapter 12. Uh, you know, when the king opposed James there uh, because of his arrogance there, killing him, ended up dying as well. So, don't refrain from true righteousness and wisdom. Of you make sure that you fear God. Fear God. Does that mean to be afraid of God? Yes, it does. Does that mean to reverence God? Yes, it does that as well. To honor God. But to be afraid. Be afraid to hurt Him. Be afraid of the consequences. I don't want to be chastened. You know, if our heart is not right with God, God does not going to hear our prayers. I don't know about you, but in this day and time we live in, we all need prayer, the ability to pray. And so we make sure that our heart is right and that we do fear God. Wisdom does have its place. Uh, yet, of course, no one is perfect in all their ways. We're all sinners. That mean give us that it's okay to sin. You know, Romans 3 says, What shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. No. We be very careful uh, about that. That no one is perfect, but don't use an excuse. Try to serve God the best you can anyway. The fear of God remains key to true knowledge and pleasing God. Don't believe everything people say. Man, aren't we not living in a time 
of conspiracy theories. Uh, because we don't like a certain person, if somebody says something about them, we automatically assume, well, they, they're right. That, that is, they're far worse than I thought they were. No. Be very, very careful about that. You may sometimes hear others say bad things about you. And if you're around people that talk bad about everybody else, what do they say about you when you're not around? Uh, you've said things that are unkind to others. And sometimes, you know, we listen to gossip and think, well, you know, I know it to be true, so it's not gossip. Oh, yeah, it's still gossip. Because you're trying to destroy someone. You're trying to destroy their character. Be very careful about that. Don't take what you hear too seriously sometimes. You know, you hear somebody say something, it doesn't matter. Move on. Do what God would have you to do. Wisdom doesn't always give the answer. Again, God doesn't always tell you what He's doing. Uh, you can pray and pray and pray, and God seems to remain silent. And maybe He wasn't silent. Maybe you just didn't accept the answer, and the answer was no. So, wisdom doesn't always tell us everything. Uh, all of this I proved by wisdom. Uh, some things by wisdom, He said, but there are some things we just won't get. I said I would be wise. This far from it. You know, I'll figure this out. No, I can't figure it out. I'll ask God. No, God told me, didn't tell me what the answer was. Uh, that which is far from exceeding deep, who can find it out. So some things in life we're going to struggle with. Uh, some things in life we're not going to get the answer to like we want there. Uh, but next time we'll uh, talk more about this. I appreciate you're viewing these videos. Again, any questions, uh, feel free to text, email, and call me if necessary. And we'll try to make sure we get all this taken care of. Thank you.